If you know a word, just say it. If you don't know a word, look carefully, decode it slowly in your head, and say it quickly when I give the signal. First word. Look at your book. First word. Sausage. I like the way you waited until I gave the signal. Well done. Next word. Next word. Pitch. Pitch. Next line. Stitch. Sip. At. Fat. Guys, I like the way you're looking carefully and just saying the words. It's really well done. Next. Pat. Nevaeh, say again. Pat. Next word. Spot. Jack. T. Next word. Ta. Ta. To get hand together. Ta. Ta. Good. Well done, guys. Now, what you did forget there is to make a mistake. <laughs> the teacher scripts in these word reading activities make reference to the two ways of reading that essentially mirror the two ways that skilled readers read either directly by sight if the word is known to you or indirectly by using the sounding out pathway if it's unknown to you. So the scripts direct the students to either name the word if they know it, so we don't want them sounding out words they already know, or to sound it out, slow down and sound it out if the word's unknown to them. In other words, we don't want them to guess if the word is unfamiliar. Slow down, look carefully and sound it out. Unfortunately, the students in this demonstration video were a little bit too clever and didn't make any errors. In fact, I'd asked them to make errors, but they were too clever by half. So I wasn't able to demonstrate how to give corrective feedback or positive reinforcement for appropriate behaviours. But what you're trying to do typically is you're prompting the correct reading behaviours. If you know it, say it. If you don't know it, sounding, sound them out. In other words, you're telling them what to do. So your job just like with any other behaviour, is to try to catch the student doing some version of those behaviours. So you catch them reading a word directly by sight. Stop them. That was great. You knew that, so you just said it. Fantastic. Or if they slow down and sound one out, that was great. You didn't know that, so you didn't guess. You looked carefully and sounded it out. That's exactly what we want you to do with words you don't know. Good. Again, like with all behavior modification methods, you can gradually fade the frequency with which you give those sorts of rewards. You certainly don't want to be giving those sorts of rewards or that sort of praise all the time because you're going to slow down the whole process and annoy the students. Give them frequently to begin with so the student's very clear on what you expect and what you value and then start to fade the frequency so eventually you're only doing it every now and again. Errors are corrected in a four-step process. The first thing you do when a student makes an error is play dumb. Students with all sorts of developmental disorders make more, we'll call them random errors, than other students. So if they were to read 10 words today, they might make two errors. If they read the same 10 words tomorrow, they'll make another two errors, but it might be for a different two words. So it's worthwhile considering the first error they make just as an I call it an attention or a, a random error. Play dumb. Sorry, I just missed that one. Can you do it again for me? And if they get it right, praise them, move on. On the other hand, if they've made a letter sound error, so if they say rut instead of rat, you point out the error. So you'll point to the letter A in the word and ask what sound. So you're prompting the letter sound rule. If they give you the correct letter sound rule, ah, ask them to then read the word and move on. If they don't provide the right rule, you give it to them. That letter makes ah. What sound? And again, ask them to read the word and then move on. But as you're moving on, you need to bear in mind that the student obviously has some confusion there. They're not quite sure what sound the letter A makes. So the next time they come to a, a word that has the letter A in it, you need to get ahead of the game, stop them and prompt the right memory. Hold on a sec point to the letter A. This letter makes the sound ah. What sound? Get the response and then get them to read the word. Then the next word that has that same letter in it, you can gradually fade the support. Stop them again, but this time you can say, what sound does that letter make? 
and then maybe the third word you can just make, say something like be careful and then the fourth word maybe say nothing at all. Your fourth step if the student still mucks up the reading of the word don't flog a dead horse just give it to them. That word is rat. What word? Get the response and move on and again be aware of words that have subsequent words that have that same letter sound rule in them. You need to get ahead of the game and prompt the student. Always better to prompt the right memory and get a correct response, albeit through supporting them, than it is to be sitting there crossing your fingers and hoping that the kid will get it right. Whenever you feel that you're mentally sitting in your chair with your fingers crossed, it's likely going to lead to a teaching error. It's a sign, that mental crossing of fingers is a sign that you need to jump in and prompt the student. The best way to run these activities in a group is to have this, all the students responding together. That can be a little bit difficult to begin with. You'll see with my little group in this demonstration video, it was the first time they'd done that group responding and they were a little uncoordinated, but the group gets better at it very quickly and it's much better to have them responding together than it is to be reading alternate words or to read a line each because obviously then the number of learning trials per student is the total number divided by the number of students in your group. In other words the students are actually doing less work. So much better to have them respond together. Sometimes students will have difficulty correctly blending the sounds in words like sad and sand and even tent or ramp, particularly early on in the program. This can be because of the effort required to access the right rules, but it's also because the, particularly the vowel sound in sad and sand, etc., are not exactly the same as, for example, um, the at sound in cat the vowel is modified slightly, particularly in words like sand and ramp, the vowel is actually modified by the nasal consonant m or n. I've never felt the need or had the need to teach that alternative letter sound rule, the a ah, made by the a ah in those particular cases. Students are quite able to assimilate the, the two um, speech sounds and you only ever have to teach that A makes A. Ah. All you need to do if they um, sound out sad as S, A, ah, D and name the word as sad, you praise what they've done well which is well done. You look carefully and sounded that one out and then model the word. That word is sad. What word? Same goes with something like sand. Often they'll have difficulty blending that, arguably because of the consonant, the nasal consonant in the cluster at the end. What you want to do is remove or uh, reduce the uh, letter sound conversion load by doing it for them. Well done. You look carefully and sounded that out. Listeners, I say it slowly, you say it quickly. S and. So what they're hearing instead of s a. Ah, N, d, which is how it will be because of the effort required for them to decode the word, they're hearing a slightly more fluent version of the sounds, s and d, and they're usually able to do the blending, at which point you say, well done, that word's sand, and move on.